This podcast was made possible by the kind support of Alvine Capital Management, a London-based specialist investment advisor and placement boutique, and the Guild of Investment Managers, which was founded in 2015 by a group of investment managers to combine the benefits of a modern, diverse, and dynamic network organization with the traditions of the livery world. Many of us will live past 100. Let's hear how we should all begin with the end in mind, in chess and in life, and we have no time to waste. Ethan David, and welcome to the 50 Faces podcast, a podcast committed to revealing the richness and diversity of the world of investment by focusing on its people and their stories. I'm joined today by Rob Gardner, who is Director of Investments at St. James's Place Wealth Management, a position he has held since early 2019. He was formerly the founder of Reddington, a consulting firm, where he spent 14 years and remains a non-executive director. He describes himself as a financial activist on a mission to make money a force for good for people and the planet and create financial well-being in a world worth living in. He is a passionate advocate for financial literacy and has written a children's book on the topic. He is on the expert committee of the Retirement Investment Systems Reform Project of the World Economic Forum. Welcome, Rob. Thank you for joining me today. Well, thank you for having me on your podcast. Well, let's start where we always start, which is the journey into the investment world. How did yours start? And we can go right back to where you grew up and what you studied. Yeah, well, look, so I actually started at Deutsche Bank working in global markets and working in foreign exchange. So how did I end up there? My mum and dad were both teachers. I was born in Holland. We traveled around a lot as we grew up. And actually, I lived in Argentina in the 80s. And that taught me a number of things. It taught me about inflation and part of my passion for financial education. But at the age of seven or eight, I think I knew the exchange rate versus the dollar of pretty much every South American country. And then later on, when I was sort of 18 or 19, I used to work in a bureau de change in the south of France. This was pre the euro. And I'd literally, people would come in with their pounds, their liras, their pesetas, their Deutschmarks, and I'd change it into French francs on the Minitel. And then I'd have to kind of race across town on a moped to turn that cash back into French francs and come back. And so it was kind of with with that knowledge that I managed to convince Deutsche Bank to get me on their summer internship program and then their grad program. And I started out in the world of foreign exchange. It's fascinating. Does that uh, mean you speak Spanish if you spent time in Argentina growing up? I do speak Spanish, but not as well as I did. And moving on from Deutsche Bank then, what drove you to branch out and start your own firm? Yeah, well, actually, between Deutsche Bank and Reddington, I I changed roles and I moved to Merrill Lynch, where I met Dawid Kanotiahulu, who is now my best friend. We co-founded Reddington together. We co-founded Mallow Street together. We've done just lots of cool stuff together. And Dawid was running an insurance and pension solutions team at Merrill Lynch, and he pioneered liability-driven investing with Friends Providence. So I was very lucky in 2003 to get hired by him and join with him. And two things came out of that. I met my wife at Merrill Lynch, so I would have never met my wife. I formed a brilliant friendship with Dawid, and we've created two brilliant businesses together. And it was in 2006 that we had had some success advising companies and their pension funds on managing their risks, that we actually thought, well, wouldn't it be good if we left investment banking and started a business that actually helped companies to better understand their assets and liabilities and to get themselves to full funding and deliver a secure pension to all their members. And that was really the genesis of Reddington. And the scary thing is it's 15 years ago that Dowd and I retired or resigned from Merrill Lynch to start Reddington. And what exactly was the gap that you perceived there? Was there no other investment consultant that could offer the same type of advice Did you think the market was primed for a new entrant? I don't think the market was primed for a new entrant. And I think if we had a pound for everyone who told us that we were nuts, we probably didn't need to start a new business. But what happened was that at Merrill Lynch, we'd identified that all these final salary pension funds were accumulating liabilities. They were long dated. They were linked to how long people live. They were linked to inflation and therefore cash flows that could be discounted back. And people weren't understanding what the mark to market impact that was and what the risk was in terms of their funding level and their financial deficit. And so 
At Merrill Lynch, we figured out that you could manage that risk using derivatives, interest rate and inflation swaps, whilst also still investing in other assets to create the growth that you need. The problem was that we were investment bankers. And so we were already perceived to sort of be trying to sell a product or a solution. And so it's fair to say there were competitors at the time, but the marketplace was Watson Wire, now WTW. The marketplace was Mercer. It was Bacon and Woodrow and latterly Hewitt, now Aon Hewitt. But they were very focused on the asset side. And I think what we brought to it was this real focus on two things. One, on assets, liabilities and asset liability management. So the two together. And then the second thing was this kind of mantra of begin with the end in mind. Where are you trying to get to in 10, 12 years time and work backwards, create a flight plan or a journey plan? And what steps do you need to take to get there? And that was the kind of key differentiator between Reddington and the other consultants at the time, and probably is still to this day. That's definitely a very powerful idea, I think, and a vision there. And what I'm hearing is that that was enough to drive you to leave a relatively comfortable position at Merrill Lynch. And in Dawid's podcast number 11, we discussed that the scrappy early days of Reddington and the place in Shoreditch or Old Street with poor heating, was the power of the idea enough to drive you? Clearly it was. But what else did you learn from that experience as an entrepreneur? Well, look, I think you've got to have a great idea and be passionate about it. One of my lessons is that we were pretty much right about everything. It just everything took a lot longer. So having financial resilience to survive is really hard. I think another kind of thing that really is important to me now is this kind of idea of relationships and relationships matter. And, you know, my relationship with Dawid, we know each other extremely well. We've probably spent more time together than with our respective wives. And I think as you go through this journey, you build relationships and who you work with, who you learn from really sets how you develop. And, you know, the success of Reddington was based on some early relationships and people who chose to back us. I mean, I want to specifically name Frank Chanella, who was the finance director at the Royal Mail at the time. And you can imagine in 2006, hiring Dawid and Rob at Reddington Partners LLP, as we were called then, to advise the Royal Mail on their, at the time, £28 billion pension scheme. That definitely was not the safe move to make. That was definitely not the pick at IBM to help you. And so if it hadn't been for those first few clients who backed us and took a risk, Reddington would never have started. And I think the same is true in life, right? We all have teachers or people in our careers who've kind of backed us and picked us out and said, I want to get behind you and help you achieve your potential. And that's really powerful. Because I had a similar experience myself. When, when I started, I had people who believed in me and backed me. And one thing that's really driven me is to pass it on, to do the same for another startup firm or another new idea. How have you tried to do that now? Yeah, look, for me, the kind of relationships matter and helping the next generation is key. I suppose at the macro level, the way I try and do that is through financial education. I mean, just yesterday, I did a after-school webinar with over 200 kids aged 7 to 11 up and down the country. I think, you know, I'm a girl guide and I teach rainbows and brownies and, and girl guides about financial education and entrepreneurship. But I also am lucky that People I've worked with over the years call me up to ask for career advice or business advice if they start a business. And it, it's just always nice to be able to share learned experiences and sort of pass it on and hopefully help them resolve an issue or a problem that they're facing and not make the same mistakes as Dowd and I did when we faced them. Well, we're going to dive into the financial literacy piece a little bit later. First, you've been involved in a report entitled, We'll Live to 100, How Can We Afford It? So how can we afford it? And what are some of the thoughts that went through this report? Well, I think we'll live to 100 is an interesting point. You've got to remember that when pensions were set up in the UK in 1908, you know, life expectancy was about 47 years. I think women was about 48 and and men was about 46. By the end of the 20th century, that had increased to 77. And today that's probably more like 86, 87. And most people age 65 underestimate their own life expectancy by about 20%. And so this idea that we're all living to 100 just forces us to maybe think differently about our own financial responsibility to our future selves rather than to our present day selves. And that's at the same time that the state and companies are basically retreating from giving a sort of guaranteed inflation-linked income in retirement. So 
we think about Reddington, we were advising those kind of the raw males and companies on their final salary pension schemes. But I certainly don't have a final salary pension scheme. I doubt that you do. I doubt that many of your listeners do. And I think here's the issue, right? That many people don't understand that looking after yourself when you stop working, that's retirement, is our responsibility. And so the idea behind that report is to say, well, one, what are the implications of us living to 100? And the implications are that in the UK, the average man will run out of money 10 years before he dies, and the average woman will run out of money 12 years before she dies. And that's A, because women live longer than men. B, unfortunately, because of structural societal issues that women tend to miss out on kind of contributions if they take time off, if they're on maternity leave or looking after children, then that period tend to not be contributing to their pension and then miss out. And thirdly, when they do set their own investment strategy, they tend to take less investment risk than men. And over decades, that can lead to the compounding up of their assets to be lower. And so really, how do we stop this issue of people retiring in poverty or running out of money in old age? And there are a number of things. First is awareness. So make sure that everyone knows how much they've got. And this is where I think something like a pensions dashboard in the UK is a brilliant idea. Another key pillar is financial literacy and financial education. And that's kind of the bit that I'm really passionate about. We learn our money saving habits on the age of seven. So how do we just get better about making decisions about money? The third thing is actually just increasing, you know, we're going to have to work longer. The retirement age has been increasing. So it used to be 65 for men. You know, my retirement age is 68. You can log on to the government website and type in your age and it will kind of tell you your retirement age. But the age at which people retire will increase. And then we need to make sure that people are saving more. The reality is in the UK, we've got auto enrollment. It started at 3%. It's now at 8%. But the truth is we need to be saving something closer to 15% to get a better outcome. And then also we need to make sure that that money is invested in the right way. And here's the really cool thing is how we invest our money is way more impactful than how we choose to spend our money from a sort of environmental perspective. And so I love this stat where if you invest your money in a sustainable and responsible way over an entire lifetime, you can have 27 times the impact than flying less and eating less red meat on your carbon footprint. And so there's this kind of real idea that the good news here is that in solving the problem, you can protect your financial future, but actually you can sort of help protect the planet as well by where you invest. Just to dig into a question there, investing your money in a sustainable and responsible way, what exactly does that mean? I think we're in a real sort of societal transition point. So in the past, and let's go to the 1980s, so business is really just focused on profit. In fact, the Milton Friedman mantra was that the sole purpose of a company was profit, regardless of their environmental impact or the impact on people and planet. So to put that in context, Exxon creates $39 billion of environmental damage every year. And that currently isn't priced into their share price, right? $39 billion of environmental damage. And what we know is that over the last 40 years, we've increased the amount of CO2 in the environment. Sea levels have risen, temperatures have risen. We've destroyed nature and habitats. And therefore, we can't continue on the path that we're going. What investing sustainably and responsibly says is that we will engage with those companies and make them responsible businesses. We'll ensure that there will be good ancestors, that they think about the impact that they have not just in one year, but the impact they'll have 10, 20 years from now. And look, we're seeing real shifts. You know, Coca-Cola have halved the amount of sugar in their products. Levi's Jeans have introduced a waste less water, which means that when they manufacture their jeans, they use 96% less water than they used to just one or two years ago. Molson Beer have found a way to use less water when they brew their beer. There are a number of beer companies that are now carbon neutral. There's a real drive this year with COP26 for all businesses really to sign up to net zero, so committing to being net zero and really thinking about their environmental impact. And then on the other side is their social impact. And again, I know you spoke to Dawid about 10,000 black interns. We're taking three or four interns from that program. We're doing a lot of work at SJP about how we build a more diverse and inclusive workspace. So, you know, why wouldn't you use your money to ensure that every business becomes a responsible business that is generating long term sustainable profits whilst having mindful of its impact on the planet and the people it employs? 
It seems to me that you're seeing this in a very holistic way, that it's inextricably connected with a return, a profitable business that delivers good investment returns. Can you just talk about that and also what the place for exclusions in a portfolio might be there for? Yeah, look, I think the, there's this myth that sort of investing sustainably and responsibly sort of impacts your returns. And that's because the predecessor was really sort of ethical investment or exclusion. So I think the problem with exclusion is it doesn't solve the problem. It just says, I won't invest my money. It's a bit like how we spend our money. I could decide not to buy Levi's jeans and buy another pair of jeans that makes it in a sustainable way, but that doesn't impact it. Actually, isn't it much cooler to own the shares, influence the executive board of that company and say, look, you're a brilliant company. You've been around for years, have an amazing brand, make fantastic products. Have you thought about finding a way to manufacture them in a more sustainable and responsible way? So actually, the crucial thing here is engagement. And I think there's a lot of work about what's the role of governments in society, what's the role of charities in society. But the reality is our corporates, our businesses, our big, well-run businesses that have infrastructure, they have talented people in them, and they can have a real impact. And so why wouldn't we want to sort of engage with those companies and say, well, look, you can still make your product and be a force for good. If you want to see what that looks like at a nation state level, just look at what Singapore have just done. They've just announced their 2030 plans. And that is a total joined up, top down, bottom up approach to environment. They're planting a million trees. They linked into their maritime policy, all of their waste that they burn, they're using to make concrete for part of their construction. They're committing to ensure that every citizen in Singapore is 10 minutes from the park. They're committing to education at a school level to make sure that as the kids come through, they really understand it. So my hope is that, you know, we all start to sort of move in that direction. But as I say, it requires us to have this kind of this good ancestor mindset where we're not just thinking about today or tomorrow. We're thinking about the decisions we make on our children and our grandchildren. And getting back to children. So what was it that drove your passion for financial literacy? And how do you propose closing the gap across different age groups? Like all of these things, it's a bit of a sort of aha moment. But at Reddington in 2012, we were thinking about our kind of what was at the time CSR, corporate social responsibility, but that's all moved on since then. But And I was trying to think, well, what can Reddington do as a business? I spoke to a few people and the counsel I got was that it's much better for a company to give away its product or its IP or its service than it is to give away money and or volunteering, you know, so volunteering to sort of plant trees or paint fences or all the rest is good, but it's not necessarily as impactful as if you can really leverage what your company is good at. So I was thinking, well, what does this mean for Reddington? And at the time, you know, financial education wasn't on the school syllabus. It didn't come in until 2014. And even today, it's far from where it needs to be. It was also, you've got to remember the 2012 was the year of auto enrollment in the UK. And it was clear to me that financial literacy in the UK and around the world was very low. And I thought, well, OK, well, what can we do to sort of tackle financial literacy? And I suppose this is the kind of scrappy entrepreneur in Dowd and me. To quote Richard Branson, screw it, just do it. We just spoke to a local school in Islington and we started teaching. They were sort of GCSE students at the time about, you know, spend versus save and pay thyself first and all the rest. And that kind of morphed into Red Start and then we realized that sort of our money saving habits are are formed by the age of seven. And there was a real lack of financial education at the primary school level. And we created this game called Money Matters. And today we're a charity and we've reached 30,000 children. And, you know, we're finding out ways to teach financial education that actually improves key stage two maths. And I suppose, why do I care about it? I think one is kind of linking back to this concept called Igikaye, which is, you know, what you're good at, what the world needs, what you can get paid for, and what you love. And so financial education is what I love. The world needs it. And it's an area where I can really, I'm good at it. I can make a real difference. And it's from nursery or rainbows right the way through up to adults. So it's kind of whole of life, but really focused at the younger end, because that's where you have the biggest long-term impact. I suppose, why did I get into it? I mentioned that my parents were teachers and we lived in Argentina We had no money living in Argentina, and I used to collect Coca-Cola bottles from the older kids and then take it and get money. And so I'd come home and my mum and dad would be like, where did you get that money? And somehow at seven, I figured out how to get hold of money. The second thing was inflation was running at 30% a month. And so every at the end of each month, my parents would get paid. 
We then go to the supermarket. Prices would change during the day, and we'd play supermarket sweep. You'd run around the supermarket, and if you got the product before the person in the shop changed the price, you could buy it at the morning price rather than the afternoon price. And so I kind of really understood the idea of inflation and keeping hold of your money. I never understood how to grow your money, and it wasn't until I started working in investment banking and in pensions that I understand the idea of kind of compounding and compound growth and investing in the stock market. And so I thought. You know, actually, the kind of principles of wealth and prosperity and financial resilience, these should be taught to everyone. And so I have this mantra, which is what if we can teach everyone how to earn it, how to keep it and how to grow it. So the earn it was me collecting Coca-Cola bottles. The keep it was sort of managing inflation risk. And then the grow it was learning how to invest in ISAs and in pensions and seeing those investments grow over time, the same way that a snowball grows as we roll it downhill. And one aspect that you haven't mentioned yet, but I'm sure is part of the education is awareness, I suppose, of debt. And I'm thinking more of of predatory lending practices or or not even just simply credit card debt and how that can mount. Is that part of your education process? Do you think that's particularly effective to teach young people about that? Yeah, look, the sad truth is that 50% of all mental well-being issues are linked to typically financial difficulty and financial resilience. And that's typically linked to indebtedness. And so the earn it, keep it bit are key to kind of creating that financial resilience to avoid going into debt. And so we teach young people a couple of concepts. So one, you know, Alfred Einstein allegedly said compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He or she who understands it earns it. He or she who doesn't pays it. And being in debt is about paying it. And then we teach kids the rule of 71. And so the rule of 71 just really says how long does it take to double your money at different rates of compound growth or interest? So if I'm earning 7% a year, I double my money every 10 years. If I'm borrowing money at 25%, then I'm doubling my money every two and a half years. So you can really get young people to start thinking about store cards and APRs and credit cards. And so one of the things that I do with young professionals when they start their career in our profession is... I teach them how to buy a house in 10 years and just show them the impact of what having a vice can have. And I'm sure my my PA won't mind me mentioning it because I've asked her before, but when she started working for me, she had a lot of store card credit debt that she'd built up was just growing and growing. And so after we started working together, she got on top of it, she got control of it. And not only has she paid that all back, but she's been starting saving up and investing in a LISA and she's now saved up enough money to buy a deposit on her house. And, you know, that kind of turnaround from indebtedness to being so sort of financially resilient and actually having money to go and buy a, an asset that builds your long term wealth, she managed to do in just four years. And wouldn't it be great if we can teach everyone how to do that? Absolutely. Even just hearing that story, I can imagine the liberating feeling that consolidating some of that debt and getting it off your shoulders must be. Getting back to the earning and perhaps the keeping part of it, the investment world itself, how are we doing in terms of diversity? If it had a scorecard, how would it score? I assume you're meaning diversity of people who work in the industry. Profession. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Look, and I know you covered this with Dawid, and it struck me actually that, you know, my wife's Iranian. Obviously, one of my best friends is Dawid. But actually, the sad thing is when I first met Dad was in 2003 and, you know, the number of black men and women working in the profession, and that's just one sort of way of looking at diversity, just hasn't changed in 18 years. And Dad talks about the kind of kinks in the hose and how do we undo it. I'm lucky I have two daughters. And I have to say that since becoming a father of two daughters, I've become a much more aware of some of the kind of lack of gender diversity in our industry. And I think like everything in life, change requires awareness. So people need to be aware of what the project is. And I think the Investment Association and the Diversity Project have done that. And then stuff like Talk About Black and Black Lives Matters and Classroom to the Boardroom, a great way to drive awareness and desire. You know, the other thing is understanding that diversity matters, that having diverse teams, having Diverse groups of people collaborating together, solving problems, creates better outcomes and therefore creates better companies and creates better products and services and is good for economic growth. And again, there's a body of evidence, you know, from the McKinsey's and the World Economic Forums and all the rest of why diversity matters. Then you need knowledge of how you do it. And then you need to sort of have the ability to execute on it. And then you need to reinforce it. And I think that the reality is, is that The industry is still at the beginning part of that journey, which is in the sort of awareness, desire, knowledge. 
now it's really about bringing about those changes. But again, you know, I, if I look at SJP, we've been on that journey and we started where we started and we've made progress in the last two years. And I think like everything in life, you just have to keep working away at them and making progress. And so right now we've got a financial futures competition aimed at young people in London. And it's really a competition. So you don't have to have a CV or interview to try and get involved. And there's five summer internships at that level. And we're reviewing the way we do our apprenticeships and our graduate program. So we need to reinvent how we think about how we attract talent into our organizations. A, to get that diversity. And then B, we need to think about culturally how we build firms that are inclusive and make people feel included when they join companies. I think you make an excellent point because it's not just about getting the talent in the door, it's about making it stay and flourish. And I think often we forget that sometimes the most talented people are there because they're driven and ambitious and want stretch assignments. And I think managing that talent is equally important, not only managing, but also measuring every year how well we're doing versus what we said we wanted. So I think it's unfortunately we're only at the beginning, but at least we've made a start. I think the progress the industry has made over the last few years, I think is positive. And I always like to think exponentially rather than linearly. So hopefully, we'll kind of accelerate on the progress that's been made. Getting back to your own career, you use a phrase that David used and loves to use about kinks in the hose pipe of life. Did you have any of those? Were there any setbacks or challenges, or even investment mistakes that you learned from? Look, I mean, not to the extent that David talks about, I think the sort of challenges that I faced were living in Argentina after the Falklands War as a sort of young English person isn't the most obvious place to be. So that was definitely sort of challenging. I think linked, then actually, my parents moved back to the UK and taught at a very well to do public school. And it's fair to say that I was made to feel like downstairs, I don't know if you've ever watched Downton Abbey, but it was very clear that I was just a teacher's son, I was privileged that I got to go to this brilliant school, effectively for free as part of my parents package working as teachers there. So I got a brilliant education, but I definitely left that school knowing that I was from downstairs, not upstairs, if that makes sense. So you carry these kind of chips on your shoulder. I certainly carried that chip on my shoulder through to university and an adult life. And I suppose all of us sort of face personal setbacks on the journey. I think I've been very lucky, though, that my parents have always been very focused on trying to get me and my sister the absolute best education. And so I suppose this kind of mindset of work hard and being given access to good education has probably set me up well. Well, certainly your references to your parents, certainly I now see where you get some of your passion for education from. Besides your parents, were there other key people who influenced you along your journey? One of them would be my granddad. I mean, my parents then worked and taught in the Middle East. So I actually went to boarding school and kind of semi bought myself up on my own from 13 onwards and had a very good relationship with my granddad. And he used to work in a paper factory in Lancashire. And I suppose he just believed in me. And I think we talked at the beginning about just having someone who believes in you. That was So just that kind of unconditional belief and support is key. Another key person was my professor at university, so Professor David Collins. He taught me glaciology and hydrology. and, And he was the first person who really taught me to think and gave me the confidence that actually you can solve problems. And the way I like to think about it is your ability to kind of look around you, take in the facts and try and figure out what's going on without actually having any kind of base knowledge in the subject. So that ability to sort of think rather than know facts and figures, which is kind of what school teaches you, was was groundbreaking. I've already talked about Dawid and then obviously meeting my wife as well, right? You know, we've known each other now for 18 years and we've been married for 12 years and we have a family together and the people we meet and form lifelong partnerships with are are very important and she's had to put up with the highs and lows of my career journey as well as our kind of family journey. That They are a critical part of our fabric and also especially in times like now when I think our worlds have been turned upside down that are these partners really are so much of the scaffolding that makes us stay standing. On a similar vein, um, any pieces of advice or creed or motto that you live by? I've got a few. I've shared one already, which is begin with the end in mind. I think it's really important. I remember like when I became a dad, someone said to me, you only have a thousand weekends with your children, spend them wisely. So that's this idea that, you know, you look forward 18 years, you know, 18 times 52 and you go, oh, okay, I haven't 
So I've really thought about it. And it's so easy to become distracted by work and everything else that you don't sort of spend enough time with your family. I think Begin With The End In Mind helps you think about the decisions we make about money and saving for your financial future and the investments we make in our relationships. The second one would be relationships matter. The relationships that you build with people over time that you truly trust that really have your back when you need it and where you have other people's back and they trust you. That has to be one of the most valuable things. And then three, you know, I have to repeat, earn it, keep it, grow it. I'd love to teach everyone on the planet the key to kind of building financial resilience is to earn it, keep it, grow it. And it seems like some of that advice, maybe you've always known, but maybe you've only learned as your career has evolved. But if you were to look back now to your young geography graduate, is there anything that you know now that you wish you had known then? Yeah, lots. But I think that what I do do now and back to your kind of giving back, I like to go back to my old school and speak to sort of sit formers there and give people advice as they sort of come to the end of their school careers is I think, look, there are three sort of forms of capital that you need to understand. And the truth is you need to keep working on them, keep building on them and keep growing them. And they're intellectual capital, social capital and financial capital. And so the intellectual capital is this idea of lifelong learning. If we're living to 100, the reality is, you know, when I was at school, I remember using the internet for the first time. I still remember the first time I plugged a 56k modem in and A lot of the companies that we know and love today just didn't even exist when I was sort of doing my A-levels. And so what the world will look like when current 17 and 18-year-olds, you know, 20 years from now, who knows? And so this kind of make sure that you keep learning. And that doesn't mean you need to do CFA or anything else, but read books, listen to podcasts. You keep yourself informed about what's happening in the world around us. The second is social capital. I'm still friends with my school friends. We're kind of having a Zoom quiz night together tomorrow night. We've known each other since 1992. I'm still good friends with all of my DB99 summer interns. So the relationships we make can become lifelong groups of people that can really support us through life. So social capital is really important. And by the way, it's important to know who to let go of as well and which relationships to dare I say it, cull and cut, not just which ones to grow and invest in. And then the third is that sort of financial capital that, you know, a lot of us start work and this is why financial education is so important. You start earning money and then you don't realize you've got to pay taxes and pay rent and and all the rest. And this kind of idea of paying thyself first. So, you know, just really teaching people to think about actually when you start working to put aside some money, either to save to buy a house or to put in your pension and learn to live on 80% of what you earn rather than on 110% of what you earn. My last question, which I'm sneaking in, is uh, one, because I always ask myself this question, pocket money. Do you think it's good for children to get pocket money? Should they earn it? Should they get it? Certainly be advised to save it. But how do you view pocket money? Yeah, look, I think if you can afford to give your children pocket money, the sooner you can empower them with making financial decisions, the better. So I have young daughters and when we could go to supermarkets or shops and they want to buy a magazine or, or something, saying you can buy that or you can choose them. When my daughter asked me for something, I said, well, you can buy that with your pocket money. Figure out how long it's going to be and how long it's going to take to save for it. So teaching planning, delayed gratification. And then if it's a lot of money, you can then have the conversation about earning it and say, well, okay, well, you can clean my car and then you can teach them negotiation skills. How much should you charge to clean my car and vacuum it and all the rest. So it's just an opportunity to have a conversation. I think one of the things I did with Save Your Acorns was create acorn cutouts and with younger children. And so, you know, with younger children, one of the challenges is kind of pad time or pep, you know TV time. So create a currency. And again, if they have good behaviors, you give them acorns and then they can choose to spend those acorns on Peppa Pig or Paw Patrol or iPad time or, or all the rest. So even if it's not with actual money, it's this idea of creating a currency and giving them empowerment about making those decisions. I have to say, I like your style. I may be borrowing that myself. Well, thank you so much, Rob. You have always been such a refreshing presence on the financial scene, such an innovator, such an active thinker, really living the advice that you've shared with us here. Thank you for sharing your insights with us. Well, look, thank you for having me. And I love your podcast. I think it's great that you're getting all your relationships together and sharing their insights to the benefit of everyone. I'm Ethan Devitt. Thank you for listening to the 50 Faces podcast. If you liked what you heard and would like to tune in to hear more inspiring investors and their personal journeys, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. 
This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be construed as investment advice and all views are personal and should not be attributed to the organizations and affiliations of the host or any guest. 